Okay, so uh, hi everyone, present and online. Uh, today we've got Alessandro Bart, who's currently at the Turin, but very soon to be at UCL. Yeah. So this is what we've got in store. Okay, over to you. Uh, so hi everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, essentially a couple of uh, work related to a couple of papers on uh, kernel discrepancies and uh, controlling convergence of distribution of kernel discrepancies. Uh, which is actually closely related to a lot of the uh, work uh, done at the fundamental of statistics of the machine learning group at UCL. Uh, and the main idea, oh, this, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, and the main idea of the talk is going to be to introduce uh, essentially the foundational concepts underpinning these uh, discrepancies, and in particular, introduce uh, kernel uh, score matching discrepancies, maximum mean discrepancies, and kernel span discrepancies. Um, now, these things are actually quite simple objects. So if I just were to write the uh, score matching on the blackboard and then on the blackboard, it would be a very simple definition that, you know, the talk would be done very quickly because these are very intuitive kind of concepts. But the way I'm going to introduce this object is going to be uh, following essentially Schwab and the RAM. So the main idea is that um, um, we will essentially try to understand how different uh, areas of mathematics view distribution, uh, like statistical distribution, like relative measures, and now this motivates these kind of discrepancies. And we will see that these kind of discrepancies have a lot of like um, underpinning mathematics, uh, which is actually very different from each other. Uh, and it's going to be in important to understand these foundational uh, mathematics behind these different notions because this is actually the way we're going to actually prove uh, results about these discrepancies. Uh, in addition, so here I'm talking mostly about the discrepancies, but actually the kind of like topological and geometric ideas that I'm going to appear in this talk also actually appear in many other like statistical uh, applications, such as like sampling, like uh, amateur Monte Carlo and so on. So another aim of the talk is also to understand how this kind of like topological and geometric ideas actually appear in statistics, because uh, in principle, these are supposed to be very distinct uh, uh, fields. And also, finally, I'll just mention a couple of key concepts related to convergence control. Uh, but I won't really go into like the deep results uh, or the results that we actually proved about characterizing when this uh, discrepancies control convergence. I'm mostly going to actually introduce the mathematics that then I use to prove these things, like motivate that mathematics. And the main reference, which actually contain uh, the results uh, that are that built on the on the topics I'm going to introduce uh, today are uh, the metrizing with convergence with maximum mean discrepancy paper, which was uh, published in Germany last year, and uh, another paper called like, Targeted Separation and Convergence with Kernel Discrepancy, which is going to appear in Germany this year. Um, okay, so the key idea is that uh, we're going to try to understand what is the distance uh, between a distribution and another distribution. Like here, I on the left, you have like a smooth distribution and a discrete distribution, a sample, but they could be two smooth distribution, two discrete distribution, and so on. And for many applications, we kind of need to have a way to quantify or to yeah, to quantify how different our row and mu. Uh, for example, in uh, goodness of fit testing, the idea is that you're given data that is generated from a Markov chain. Uh, so data xi, and uh, you want to check whether the invariant distribution of this Markov chain, uh, new here, which should be mu, uh, coincide with the target. That's uh, one application. Another one is uh, when you're trying to sample or approximate a distribution row, pro uh, usually a smooth distribution row with a product density. What you're trying to do is uh, to generate some samples or some particle approximation using uh, location xi, kind of empirical measure like this. And you want to test how close is actually this empirical distribution to the target row, and maybe even how you can improve the location of this XI so that it becomes closer and closer to row. Uh, another application is to sample testing. In that case, usually uh, you, both your distribution are discrete, and you just want to dis you, you just want to measure the distance between the samples, discrete distributions, and generative model fitting, in which you're just uh, comparing a distribution that generates fake data. To the one to the real data that you actually have, and you're trying to quantify how far the fake data is from the real data. So in all this uh, application, we need to have some kind of like uh, understanding of how different rule and mu are. So we have usually we call this a distance intuitively. Um, 
So in mathematics, or even like the way we think about the distances in real life, is usually things called like geodesic distance. So the way I think about my distance between me and x is not just a number, it's actually a number associated to a path. Like I'm gonna walk from uh, here to FX, and I'm gonna this I'm gonna integrate that path, like I curve this curve, and I'm gonna get a length. So these are called like geodesic distance. They're essentially the most intuitive type of distance, and usually, yeah, the way we think about this is from like a classical physics perspective. These distances have key properties that usually we generalize using things called like metric spaces, and we obtain metric distance. Metric distances are not necessarily associated to paths. For example, they're motivated from quantum mechanics because in quantum mechanics, paths like between like the path of a particle does not make sense anymore. So in that case, you still want to have like notions of distances, but they're not necessarily associated to a path. And this gives you a notion of metric distance, which has these three properties. We want the distance between two points to be zero if and only if the two points are equal. We want the distance between a point to another point to be the same as the distance from that point to the initial point. So essentially, there's no going. Yeah, there, there's no there, there's a symmetry. There's no difference between going from A to B and going from B to A. And the last one is called the triangle inequality, which tells you essentially like uh, uh, the the number I give to the distance between A and B is the smallest possible in the sense that if I were to pass by another point C on my way to A and B, it would increase the distance. This is called like the triangle inequality. These are kind of like this classical notion of uh, distances from like mathematics and physics. Uh, in statistics, this is going to be asking for too much. We're not going to be interested in, well, these, these kind of distances are going to be more on the background. We're going to mostly be interested in things like statistical discrepancies and uh, and the fact that these discrepancies are actually computationally intractable. This is going to be essentially the two key things. Well, yeah, the, yeah, the two key aspects are going to be like uh, that our distances is able to distinguish in between distribution. Uh, so the, the distance or the discrepancy between uh, uh, rho and mu is equal to zero if and only if they're equal. We're not necessarily going to have symmetries. So the discrepancy between rho and mu might not be the same as the discrepancy between uh, uh, rho and mu. And, um, and uh, to be informative, we will also report that something more will require that this discrepancy control convergence. So what I mean is that this um, property that I just wrote just tells us something whether two distributions are equal, yes or no. But for many applications, we need a lot more than that. We need the discrepancy to be informative even, even when they're not equal. Uh, so in that case, we will also need the, the discrepancy to control with convergence. So what that means is that whenever, this, whenever you have a sequence of distribution that seems to converge to, so you have a sequence of distribution rho n that seems to converge to rho with respect to discrepancy, that should imply that rho n actually converges to rho with respect to a legitimate notion of convergence, which could be many things, but in this case, it's going to be weak convergence. Another option could be, like, for example, Vashtan convergence on the right-hand side. But essentially, the case is that if you think you're getting closer with respect to your statistical discrepancy, this left-hand side, then rho n should actually be getting closer to rho. And uh, when we say matrix with convergence, we mean uh, that the converse is also true. So essentially, if uh, rho n is converging to rho with respect to the discrepancy, uh, then that should be equivalent to rho n converging to rho uh, weakly, so with respect to weak convergence. And just to remind everybody, so weak conversion just means that the expectation, the integration with respect to the continuous bounded function are converging. So if you integrate rho n here uh, with a, if you integrate a continuous bounded function with respect to rho n, then this uh, integrals, this thing eventually is converging to the integral of f with respect to the target. Um, okay, so we're going to try to build the discrepancies. And to that, we're going to need to understand what a distribution is. Now, distribution is uh, usually associated to the notion of measure and integration. So it's essentially a central concept of mathematics. And the corollary of that is that essentially every area of mathematics is going to have its notion of distribution. And this should not be seen as distinct. They are all like uh, compatible or some like uh, stronger than other generalization, but all are like very closely related. But they are, they are distinct and they, they use quite different tools. So usually from a statistical perspective, we use the analysis perspective, uh, in which case like we define the pro like distribution using measure theory and priority theory. So like this uh, Kolmogorov axioms and so on. Uh, but there's gonna there's gonna be other 
uh, definition of distribution, which are more common in physics and mathematics, and which are going to be actually the one that we do use to construct score matching, maximum discrepancy, and KSD. So this notion of distribution, uh, this notion of discrepancy, we usually use different uh, tools rather than those from like parity theory. So one will go over to define maximum discrepancy is going to be the one from topology, in which we will define uh, distribution to be some continuously inner functional over some function spaces. Uh, there's going to be also the one from geometry, which we'll use to define score matching and KSD, in which case distributions are defined as a distribution of one density. So one density is going to be a, a geometric smooth object, and distribution is going to be the, the non-smooth generalization of that. So we'll define a bit more precisely what it means after. Uh, I'm only going to talk about this free notion of distribution from geometry to polygon analysis, but there's actually many, many others. Uh, for example, from algebra, usually you define distribution to be a positive linear functional over an algebra function, like a filter algebra. Uh, that's going to be closely related to topological one, but instead of continuous, you have positive, so it's going to have different generalization. Uh, you can also, also have like much more complex uh, definition of uh, distribution from non computative geometry, uh, which are closely related to compact operator and Dick Smith trace from functional analysis. And then you're going to have like a notion of distribution that comes from category theory, which is uh, actually a quite cool one, in which you don't actually define distribution. You just define the way distribution behaves. Uh, so you're never going to bother defining any complex mathematics. You're just going to do all your calculation using diagrams. It's going to be like a, a bit like Feynman diagrams in physics, but that's the statistical version. Uh, so it's used quite a lot in computer science uh, in this last few years. OK, so if we have a classic priority theory perspective on distribution, usually what we do is we compute expectations. So one way to understand the difference between uh, rho and mu is to just compare the expectation of, uh, of a random variable f. So how is this different? How is this interval different from this interval? Now, if you only compare one function, that's not going to give you that much information about the difference between rho and mu. So usually what you're actually interested in is what's called a worst case integration error with respect to a set of functions. So you're just going to define the discrepancy to be the supremum over that function, uh, the certain function of the expectation, and just, yeah, that's going to give you the worst case integration expectation error uh, between rho and mu. And uh, there's some famous example from priority theory, one is in which your set of functions is just uh, essentially bounded uh, function with like norm less or equal than one, so the unit goal. And that's going to give you the total variation distance. And uh, in the case in which uh, the set of functions is given by indicator functions, uh, that's going to give you the Kolmogorov of distance. Uh, what's actually already interesting when you look at these definitions is that the domain of the functions kind of appear only indirectly. What we see here is we're actually already acting by integration over a function space. We're already considering the action of distribution over functions. So in a sense, in some sense, the domain, what, what really matters is the function space, the way distribution acts on functions rather than the actual domain of the function. And this is going to be like a, it's a foundational result in mathematics, which is a result that allows you to connect many different areas of mathematics together, which is that spaces are very complex. But function spaces are much nicer. And there are results uh, called like Joseph duality, an extension of that, that tells you that actually the function space already summarizes all the results of the space. So you can kind of actually forget your space, even as even the domain of your function, even as the actual thing you're interested in, you can just consider your function space. And these are going to be much nicer because, for example, function space are usually linear. You can add functions, but you cannot always add uh, points, like points in a domain. For example, if you're in a sphere, the sum of two points in a sphere is not going to be in the sphere anymore. So the topological approach to distribution is actually built on this result, that we're interested in much more function spaces than actually domain. So to compare actually these two perspectives, in measure theory, what you do is you define, you have a set. And then the way you define your measure is by defining some properties over a subset, like what we, what we call measurable subset. And then once we have defined how this measure acts on subset, we will define integration uh, by essentially approximation. So essentially measure theory, you just uh, first define uh, the measure of subset. Then you consider that to be uh, also defining the integral of the indicator function over that subset. And then you try to approximate. You try to define the integral of an actual function f, a more complicated one, by um, better and better approximation in the range variable, in the y variable, 
uh, of the function f. So you try this, this rectangle here are going to be like becoming smaller and smaller. This is the Lovac integral. This is different from the one we learned in school, the Riemann integral, which is actually using approximation on the x side. So here, uh, the, these rectangles are becoming smaller and smaller on the y perspective, not on the x. In the Riemann integral, it's going to be the x. Now, the topological perspective is not going to actually consider a uh, subset at all. It's just going to define, actually, integration first. So we're first going to define the action of a distribution on a function space. And then we're going to recover the, the measure of subset using the integration of continuous function. So basically, here, this function is going to be always very nice. So you're usually going to be continuous function. And then we'll basically do the reverse of approach. So in that perspective, the classical topological perspective, a uh, measure is simply defined as a continuous linear functional on the space of uh, continuous linear uh, continuous function with compact support. So essentially, the, the space of measure is just going to be the dual space of that space. So the, the space of continuous linear functional over that space. I'm not going to define the topology that we use here, but it's like a topological vector space. So you can actually define what it means to be continuous. And this is well defined. A CC is just a choice that allows you to give, get all measures. When you want to consider specific measures with like nice properties, for example, finite measure, then you can consider different function spaces, for example, continuous bounded functions with an appropriate topology. It's dual, gives you the space of finite measure, or compactly, compactly supported measure is the dual of all continuous functions. So this approach to measure theory it was built by uh, Nicolas Bourbaki. Uh, does anyone know what it is? Why did you have a picture of it? I don't know. You, you want to see? Yeah, no, you know, right? Yeah, you know. So Nikola Rubaki is the greatest mathematician that never existed. So it's not an actual person. Uh, it started by a prank. Uh, so basically, there was this famous mathematician called Elie Cardon, super famous mathematician in France. And he once received a letter of introduction to this guy called Rubaki by another famous mathematician called uh, André Bayle. And André Bayle so basically gave this letter of his friend called Rubaki, which was like supposed to be like some uh, so kind of Eastern European uh, brand that was uh, taking his time playing cards in Paris and was interested in like, mathematics and he had these cool ideas. And he kind of gave like these ideas to, to Carton, which then was like, okay, this is actually interesting. And he started to publish uh, the papers by Bourbaki without realizing that Bourbaki never existed. It was just a prank. It was a prank that actually uh, really changed mathematics because uh, Bourbaki ended up being like a massive group of like mathematicians. Many won the Fields Medal. And they actually met together every summer and they started going over like different topics, for example, integration. And they were just like literally in a seminar like that, just going over, trying to define what was, well, what was a measure, what is a topological vector space, all these key domain mathematics. And just trying to have something which was um, quite rigorous, but not ultra formal. So not as much as the German school of mathematics, which is like very formal. We're still trying to like have the nice definition for like, kind of like, a focus on clarity. And it ended up like really changing like many areas of mathematics and yeah. yeah. But it all started by a prank. And uh, but yeah, this is one of the classic books on integration that uh, one of maybe the earliest massive book on integration, uh, which uh, consider like a uh, measure that continues your functional for the topological viewpoint. Uh, I don't know if it's the first one because the Laurent Schwartz that I mentioned before actually won the Fields Medal. Uh, for a generalization of this concept in which you do a uh, short distribution of continuous linear functional and you extend measure theory that way. But essentially, this is really one of the most famous books on that topic. Um, anyway, so from that perspective, uh, measures are not going to be just continuous linear functional on a function space. We're going to forget about uh, measurable functions, sigma algebra, they're going to be irrelevant. We're just going to have like some kind of actions over function state, which is continuous and linear. And uh, to be sure to distribute, so we're trying to de de decide whether two distributions are the same, whether mu is equal to rho. <laughs> and uh, essentially what we're trying to check is uh, whether the integration of functions agree for a sufficiently large space of functions. However, if we use a too large space of function, which we need to be sure mu is equal to rho, that's gonna be lead to some uh, intractable integral parity metric. We're gonna have to compute too many integrals. And it's just now result in an intractable discrepancy. Uh, but this is where now we, we introduce topology, but this is actually where topology is going to become useful because topology is going to be able, is going to allow you to do the same, but with less. So essentially, the idea of topology is that topology is the theory of, of approximation. It defines what it means for something to converge. What does it mean to get close to something? 
So in particular, on our function space, we have some topology, which allows you to define when a sequence of function is converted to another function. What continuity tells you is that the action is preserved. So essentially, if f of n is converging, uh, the sequence of n is converging to f, then the, the integral the integral is also converging. And what it allows you to do is to ignore all limit points. Because actually, to compute the integral of rho respect to f, of f with respect to rho, sorry, we don't need to know this anymore. We can just compute, if we know already the integral of rho of fn with respect to rho, then we can just, well, it's going to be the limit of that. So essentially what the body does is it takes a function space, and it tells you all limit points are irrelevant. I can just look at like what's called like a dense subset, so uh, a set of which every other point can be a limit point of element of that subset, and then just focus on that. So essentially, it is sufficient if you want to check whether the integrals of rho and mu agree on a large function space. It is actually sufficient to only consider a dense subspace, H of x. Uh, so in other words, if expectation agrees over the function in H, they would agree over the function on f. That's kind of the key idea. Uh, another way to say this is that uh, the dual, so the, the, the map, the restriction, so if you have a continuous functional on this bigger space and you restrict it to only act on this smaller uh, space H, that's going to be injected. Now, injectivity is something that has nothing to do with topology, but essentially this is what we really care about. Uh, but topology gives us a way to answer this question once we have continuity. So this is going to be the key goal of topology. It's going to be to allow us to do the same with a lot less functions in our function space. Uh, in the nice case in which the subset H is going to have a norm, we can actually also use the norm uh, to compute the distance between a row and mu. So now the, the distance between row and mu is just going to be the, the distance of the restriction to H. So, okay. So basically now we want to construct this like nice uh, subspace that are going to be enough to test like much more subsets of big function space, which are going to be enough to test uh, uh, whether two measures agree. So a key concept we have for the concept of kernels is a super important concept, but that seems to be very hard to actually understand what, how it is defined. So does anyone want to try to define kernels? And I don't have an answer, like my answer is going to be a guess. Uh, so does anyone actually think they know what a kernel is? So basically, well, okay. So. Maybe, okay, there's one uh, standard notion of kernel, which has nothing to do with what we'll do. It's called like in linear algebra, which is just says the kernel of a map is just the element which are mapped to zero. And that's going to be completely unrelated to what we're doing now. We're going to use another definition of kernel, which comes from uh, function analysis. So I don't know exactly what a kernel is, but it seems to be, or at least according to Schwartz, that's what it is. So a kernel is going to be, is also always defined with respect to a function space, so a uh, space of function with like topology. It's going to be any uh, continuous linear map from the draw of that uh, function space to the function space. So this is very abstract because actually it's going to include very different type of things that we call kernels. Like uh, the most maybe standard one is called like integral kernels in which uh, f is going to be the space L2. And in that case, essentially, these uh, this cap are just going to be, you can think of them as function of two variables, and they're going to like take a measure uh, with a square integrable density. They're going to integrate that. They're going to integrate this function here of two variables respect to one of the variables, and you get a, get a new function. That's one type of kernel, which we're not going to be interested in, but that's one type of kernel. Uh, another type of kernel is called like Schwarz kernels. That's the type of kernels you see in PDEs. Uh, when you try to uh, solve all these. So in that case, the function space F is going to be the space of um, Schwarz distribution. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so let me, sorry, roughly if you can come, so just to be strong. Uh, it, it could be, if you want, it could be the one, it, sometimes it's going to be the space of rapidly decaying functions, but let's say more generally, it's going to be the space of compactly supported smooth functions, yeah, that functions. Uh, but again, you can change that. Uh, um, yeah, so that's going to be what we call short kernel. Uh, we're not going to be interested in those. We're going to be interested in things called like Hilbertian kernels, which arise whenever k kappa is symmetric and positive. Uh, 
Uh, so really symmetric, yeah, just as a matrix, like it could be like the transpose is the same as uh, kappa itself. So kappa transpose is the same as kappa. And positive just means that if you apply kappa to a function neutral, so f star is going to give you a function f. And if you reapply f star to that, you're going to get something positive. Now, the key thing about this kernel, this Hilbertian kernel, is that they parameterize uh, Hilbert, Hilbertian subspace of a function space. So basically, to any kappa, they correspond exactly one uh, nice subspace, which is going to have like a, which is going to have a linear product. So these are going to be the kernels we're interested uh, for score matching, MMD, and KSD. Uh, the key thing is that once we have such a Hilbertian kernel, we have uh, an associated Hilbertian subspace, and we get a kernel embedding, like a kernel embedding in this context, is just going to be the restriction of our continuous linear functional on the wall function space to the subspace. That's where we're going to go the kernel embedding. The cool thing about that is that because we have a map from F star to H to K, we can define an inner product on uh, uh, F star because we have an inner product on H K. So this is going to be uh, the way Hilbert and subspace appear in our theory. There's going to be like this nice subspace which has this inner product. Um, yeah, so essentially we'll go over MMD, KSD, and score matching. But actually, the the main story is that the MMD is going to be associated to our RKHS in which uh, F is a space of uh, just all functions. KSD is going to be uh, also an RKHS in which F is a space of vector fields. And score matching is going to be uh, not an RKHS, just another Hilbert space in which F is also a space of vector fields. So it's also still the Yeah. It's H the same as H kappa. Uh, yeah, sorry. H is the same as H kappa. But when you say for continuous subspace, you mean in other places embedded? Uh, continuously embedded. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yeah, so basically, we're going to explore Hilbert space. are going to be specific types of RKHS of uh, Hilbert and subspace in which F is just the space of all functions from uh, from a from a domain M to R. In which case, if you have that and you use an appropriate topology of point-wise convergence, then the dual of that is going to be just the space of finite measures. So if I just reread what I said, the definition above, you see that RKHS is a is any Hilbert space of functions over which the Dirac distributions act continuously and linearly. So this is going to be the definition of, uh, of well, this is a classical definition of RKHS. Uh, the nice thing is that uh, because th this kappa function that parameterizes this RKHS is also going to define a reproducing kernel uh, in this case, which is called KFXY, which is just given by applying kappa to Dirac measure. And the distance, the discrepancy that we get uh, by restricting our measures from the space of all functions, uh, our general measure from the space of all functions to our KHS is just going to be uh, defined by integration of that kernel function. Uh, so this is going to give us a very nice uh, definition of distance because it's, well, only integration appears. So if it's easy to sample from one mu, then you get something which is easy to compute. It's also very nice because this kind of like single function that parameters our entire space uh, fully defines, well, not fully, but actually summarizes a lot of the properties of our RKHS, of our space of function. For example, if K is differentiable, then all the functions in the RKHS will be differentiable, uh, and so on. Uh, same with the in integral properties. And uh, so here you can see a couple of like uh, standard type of producing kernels. Um, for example, the Gaussian, uh, the Passion, and so on. The Gaussian is one of the most famous. Uh, the rational polarity is used quite a lot, and the button as well. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see in what space they're dense. So when we say they're SPD, what we mean is that they're dense uh, in the space of all functions that we find above. When we say C, that means characteristic, which that means they're, they can separate all distributions, or they're dense in the space of all finite measures with zero interval. Uh, what we call U is uh, universal, so that means they're uh, dense in the space of all uh, continuous function vanishing at infinity. Uh, now, you can see from this definition of kernel, which is not the usual one that are introduced in standard machine learning and statistical courses, that the key thing about kernels is fully topological. So essentially, kernels are uh, their objects, which are by nature uh, topological, and then essentially the consequence of that is that all the properties that we're going to have to prove about MMD, KSD, and score matching are going to be topological or more. They're going to be either topological or geometric. Uh, so measure theory will, will play a 
very, very small role in the study and the analysis of MND and PSD, but topology and geometry will play a much uh, stronger role, at least in the yeah, characterizing when you control convergence and so on. Um, I'll mention quickly two theory, uh, two results that we proved the, in our paper, which are which are quite interesting. Uh, the first tells you that on a compact space, if you separate, if your MMD, your maximum discrepancy, separates all distribution, all uh, all uh, priority distribution, then that's actually equivalent to matrizing with convergence. So matrizing with convergence, remember that tells you that convergence in MMD is the same as with convergence. That in, in principle, that seems like a lot stronger than just separating the distribution. But on a compact space, these things are going to be equivalent. That's a very nice properties of, uh, of kernels. Um, in other words, separate distribution is enough to matrize the weak convergence. However, that's going to be only a, a thing that only holds for compact spaces. And what can go wrong with the kernel discrepancy is a thing called like uh, mass diffusion, essentially a lack of sequential compactness. Which tells you that uh, thickness of distribution, of priority distribution, can converge to zero. So they can lose all their priority mass. Normally, a sequence of priority distribution, if they converge weakly, or if they have like a subsequence that converge, they, it always converge to like a, a measure which also has integral one, it's a priority measure. But this is not going to be uh, the case anymore on non convex spaces because of this property. However, you have a nice uh, result that also holds for locally compact spaces, including Rn, which tells you that weak convergence now is equivalent to separating all finite measures. So essentially, to control weak convergence of, uh, to make sure weak convergence of priority distribution, we will have to separate more than priority distribution. We will have to separate all finite measures. But if we do that, then we can prevent this mass escape. So these are just like a nice result that tells you a bit uh, the kind of assumptions uh, and just, yeah, relation between NMD conversion and weak conversion that you can prove. But I'm not going to, yeah, it's just uh, to give an example. We, we don't care that much about those. Uh, sorry, do you have a question or? No. no I'm just so it's like if you allow binary maps to cross for That's what he said, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah. The, the exactly, yeah, yeah. So here the weak conversion yeah, is still right. off priority measures. Exactly, but in order to, well, we need to separate. So, what we need to embed, restrict in our, in, uh, yeah, just use a kernel, kernel embedding on, are going to be not, not just priority measures, they're going to be all finite measures. Um, yeah. This is, it can be stupid. It's like RN and back measure or mass graph. So, stop the mass graph scale. Uh, I mean, the, so the Lubeck measure on a compact set will still essentially be, yeah, okay, it will be, yeah, oh yeah, okay, locally compact. So that would not be finite. So the Lubeck measure on Rn is not finite. So, so th those you're not gonna, I'm not gonna consider those. Uh, right angles sufficiently large that if I see, the way I cannot get the mass. I mean, this is the idea. This is the idea because the tension. No, no, this is exactly this is the idea. So in a locally compact space, because you can kind of like consider increasingly large, you can cover your space by increasingly large compact set, uh, then provided you can separate kind of measure that allows you to kind of control what happens at infinity. Um, but there are similar results that hold beyond locally compact space. So it's even though the relation between those two facts, it's not a simple one, to, like it's not a simple explanation like that. Um, but it is always related to sequential compactness, which then is related to tightness, which has like a uh, um, relation with like uh, locally compact, locally compact plays a role in like this kind of result. Um, yeah. So yeah, the, the thing is that the MMD, okay, so it's nice. So we can prove uh, nice things about it. Um, it's not so practical whenever we cannot sample from a distribution row, actually. Yeah. How much time do you have? Um, yeah, so essentially, I MMD mean, is not so practical when you, because you need to compute integration, it's not so practical when you cannot sample easily from a distribution row. Uh, in particular, this is going to be the case whenever rho is like a smooth distribution, P of X, DX. Uh, those are typically hard to integrate. And uh, well, that's going to be a problem for MMD. It's not going to be easy to get the. Uh, Unbiased the sample uh, ID samples uh, from from row. Um, 
So the thing is that before we reconstructed uh, MMD, we started from the same ideas as IPM, as interoperability metric, that we were gonna kind of like consider, uh, we're gonna, we were gonna do a discrepancy by considering the side measure uh, rho vs uh, minus mu. So essentially this, you, in, in an IPM, you really see you have rho minus mu applied to F, that's kind of like the thing you're measuring, that's the difference of expectation. So if you build a discrepancy using this difference, using a side measure, of course, as I measure, usually acts by integration. So your 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 discrepancy will rely on integration back to rho. So this point of view will necessarily require integration. So this is now where geometry is going to come into play. Uh, we're going to want to do something else. We're not going to construct our distance using a side measure using this difference between mu and rho. We're going to try to leverage uh, the smoothness of rho when it is smooth. So usually when people think about smooth distribution, they think about smooth priority densities. Um, so in that case, you would typically uh, try to leverage either the, the, the derivative of P or the derivative of like uh, the log density and so on. That's the kind of thing you would try to build your discrepancy on. Um, now this is not very nice uh, mathematically because your density is not something that is canonically associated to your distribution rule. So you need to choose a reference measure to do that. If you choose a reference measure, your P is actually only gonna define almost everywhere. It's not gonna be an actual function. Uh, but also this gradient is gonna depend on the type of reference measure you use. If you use a Gaussian reference measure or Lebesgue reference measure, you're not gonna get the same gradients. So, the, so if this kind of raises the question, like what is actually the differential information associated to like a smooth distribution? So what is actually a smooth distribution? And this is where kind of like geometry comes in. So up to now, all the mathematics I've talked about is essentially developed by uh, Schwarz. And now we're gonna get into things developed by Deram. Uh, what Deram kind of tried to do is to define, well, one of the things he did was to define what it actually means to be a smooth distribution and invented a thing for like a uh, twisted differential form to do that. Essentially, the, the idea is, is uh, the key that we're, that we're trying to do is that we're trying to define not only how a distribution acts by integration of function, but also at how it acts point-wise. So we want to make sure that, you know, when we have a Gaussian distribution, our density is not e to the minus x square, uh, one over two x square, almost everywhere. It's actually precisely that smooth function e to the minus x square. You want to, uh, you want to ensure that the point-wise value of the Gaussian have a meaning. And if you just do integration respect to a Gaussian, those values have no meaning. So the way we're going to actually define this infinitesimal integration, this value of the Gaussian at x, this e to the minus x squared over 2, is going to be using, well, different geometry, infinitesimal quantities. So in principle, the infinitesimal quantity is something which is uh, arbitrarily small. It's smaller than any epsilon. Uh, now, usually something which is more than any epsilon is basically just 0. And that, this is kind of, kind of the key Keep probably in mathematics, the geometry, differential geometry is how do you actually make sense of something if it is small without it being just zero. So the way uh, mathematician like uh, Gauss, Riemann, and then Carton and Deram kind of like uh, solve this problem was to develop something which is called like tensor calculus, which is basically going to say like uh, at every point x to define an infinitesimal quantity there, we're going to be actually it's just a point where we're going to define an entire vector space over that. These vector spaces, one of them is, uh, would be the space of like tangent vectors. So if we like, quickly go back to this image, so this is going to be an example of infinitesimal quantity. Like here, we're going to get a geodesic distance by integrating like this tangent vector. So here you at this point, you have a narrow, which you can think about infinitesimal motion. It's not actually moving on the on this hemisphere. It's actually just telling you where you're going to move next. And you can see this, uh, this, this, this arrow doesn't live on the space, on the hemisphere. It lives on this yellow vector space over that space. Uh, what we're gonna, and this is going to be an example of infinitesimal quantity. It's going to be this, this tangent vector here to the curve is going to be, well, yeah, a tangent vector, which is going to be living on something called a tangent space, which is represents something in the decimal. It's not quite on the space, but it aims to then be integrated to define something on the space. In this case, you're going to integrate tangent vectors over that entire curve, like this, to get a distance. I'm going to try to, and we basically, uh, 
define uh, uh, distribution, we're going to do the same. Instead of just considering infinitesimal direction, we're going to consider infinitesimal uh, parallel events. So at every point x, we're going to define like a vector space of w of little uh, parallel pipettes, which are infinitesimal small. So essentially, they're going to live on, on vector spaces over that single point x. So they're actually going to be quantity defined at a single point, but they're not going to be zero. And again, the way we do that is by defining a new space over x. Um, so in that context, rho is uh, this uh, smooth distribution are no longer going to be measured. They're not going to be continuous linear functional either, or actually they're going to be not as important. They're going to be something called like tensor one density or twisted form, which are basically something that act by integration over this infinitesimal uh, parallel pipet. Uh, so this is an example of how this integration would look like if this is a parallel pipet over X. And these are two vectors. You can like define a matrix with these two vectors. You're going to compute that determinant that's going to give you how you actually algebraically get like a number out of this quantity. But yeah, this is going to be the infinitesimal integration operation. So essentially, the difference between one density and the measure is that measures can only integrate functions, while one density can integrate both functions and infinitesimal uh, volume elements. And this ability to integrate uh, infinitesimal volume elements is what's going to give meaning to the value of uh, distribution at a specific point. Just find row of this. Find the value of the and also the actual row of that. Exactly. Yeah. What's the key in? Right. Oh, sorry, that should be an X. Oh, okay. sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, this should be X. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, exactly. It's not a choice of W, it's just... Yeah. So W is going to be, it's going to be a space of infinitesimal, so it's going to be called a space of N vectors. Yeah. Uh, it's just like a... Exactly, it's built out of the tangent space. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, you, you do some Grassmann algebra of the tangent space, and that's how you get it. Uh, but yeah, basically, you, you, on any smooth space, you can define these like tensor spaces, and then uh, out of these vectors, that vector you're going to define these n vectors, uh, n being just the dimension of your space, and then you're going to define uh, distribution by how they act on the uh, the subjects. So basically, okay. So now we have a well-defined notion of actually smooth distribution, uh, which comes from differential geometry. So differential geometry actually enter the pictures. Uh, so now we can define our our new type of discrepancy. Um, so the key, the standard idea in statistics would be to like this is how you think about statistics usually is to define a discrepancy that uses uh, the difference of the log density. So you're just thinking about uh, yeah, you're gonna try to do a discrepancy using this object. Um, now, usually the way statisticians motivate this subject is just by saying, well, we only know P up to normalization, so the log is kind of convenient, it disappears if you take the log because the normalization constant will be differentiated, it's a constant, so it's going to be zero. So usually, uh, this is kind of the motivation for the logarithm. Uh, this is how it's introduced. This is sometimes called the Stein score, if you're part of like the Stein uh, cult, uh, where everything becomes a Stein thing. Um, so it's not the usual score because you don't differentiate respect to parameter, you differentiate respect to your domain. Now, I that if you come from a geometric perspective, well, you're not going to be happy at all with that because the logarithm is completely arbitrary and it's not a differential operator. So this is a big, big problem, is that um, your logarithm, it was nice because it got rid of your normalization constant of P and Q, but it introduced something which is not a geometric quantity because it, this logarithm is kind of like well, it acts by composition over P and Q. It doesn't act by as a differential operator. Uh, in particular, it's not linear because that's how you get rid of the normalization constant. So we're not going to use this, this operator. This is not going to be actually the geometric quantity we use. We're going to use something different. Uh, I'm not going to explain where it comes from, but essentially, once you've defined this, like, uh, once you've understood this smooth distribution or one densities, then you can use something called homology uh, to motivate three uh, like you know, to prove there exists like three canonical differential operator associated to like a smooth uh, distribution. One of them is going to be the one that you use for all uh, diffusion type of models. So it's going to be one that characterizes all uh, measure preserving diffusion. I'm not going to introduce that one, but this is one of them. The the one we will use is the one that uh, that is more closely related to like uh, discrepancy is a covariant derivative. So essentially, you can prove that. Uh, well, you can construct this operator. Uh, so now your row uh, 
uh, you have this NABLA row, so this scholar covariant derivative, it acts on like distribution mu, and it acts this way. So don't worry if you don't understand, if you don't know this uh, type of this product, but the idea is that you're taking a ratio between mu and rho. It's not a rather nicotine derivative, but it's it's kind of better. It has like a well-defined point value. You're going to differentiate somehow, so there's going to be a derivative that you can use to differentiate. And then you're going to get, you're just going to take the tensor with rho. Now, the key thing about this mathematical object, it, well, it has no logarithm, which is good, but actually it acts as, this, as a different operator over mu. So it, it, for example, it acts linearly, linearly over mu. So it's, it's going to depend on its, on its uh, normalization constant. It will not depend on normalization constant of rho, but that is actually a good thing that it depends on normalization constant of mu, because it means that we're going to be able to use what is called distributional geometry to generalize that to arbitrary mu. So at the moment, I've I told you we're differentiating mu, so you know if, if this is a density, this would be just a derivative of the function. But actually, we're going to be able to differentiate to to define this thing even when mu is, for example, like Dirac measure. So you know, in protein theory, you're usually told that you can only take the random nicotine derivative between absolutely continuous measures. That is not true in geometry. In geometry, you can take the derivative between a Dirac measure and you know like a, a Gaussian. You have no problem with that. Um, so this is very cool because now we have this operator which uses the smoothness of rho, but also will not make any assumption on the smoothness of mu. So you, mu will be able to be discrete, it will be able to be uh, continuous. Uh, just to give you a little bit of intuition between what this covariant derivative is, it's just, so I told you that rho, like one density is, uh, what they do is they define it to decimal integration. And this covariant derivative is just gonna, something which is going to measure uh, how, how the um, infinitesimal, interi infinitesimal interval operator as to run mu uh, change as we follow our vector field. So as we, as we have a vector field here in some direction, as we follow this curve, how is the area that rho and mu give to w, how the ratio of that is going like, to change over that curve? This is kind of like the idea between this covariant derivative. It's like a different operator on a space of measure. Uh, and again, so be, because now we are acting as a different interpreter mu, we're going to be able to extend that to not the object. But I think this is the last important uh, idea I want to introduce, which is how you actually extend this kind of thing to uh, non scope object, which is the key idea of distributional geometry. Um, so there were two big ideas. Uh, one of them, uh, Laurent Schwartz won the first medal for, and the other one, George Durand, became one of the most, one of the biggest name in, in mathematics. It's whenever you, if you do a math degree, you will hear the name uh, all over the place. The key idea uh, from the point of view of, of Laurent Schwartz was to try to build topologies for which every locally integrable object would become differentiable. So normally we can only differentiate smooth objects, but now Laurent Schwartz was trying to also differentiate uh, delta functions from engineering and physics. So things which are like not smooth, you can think about it as a direct measure, and also like look like uh, locally integrable, like uh, like for example vector fields with non-smooth coefficients. How do you differentiate a non-smooth function? How do you differentiate like a non-smooth vector field? He was trying to build like budget that would allow you to do that. From the point of view of, and this is how I build like uh, distributional distribution theory, and he won the first medal. At the same time, or more or less at the same time, uh, George Ram built a field which is like both more and less general of what Schwarz was doing. But, and what he was trying to do, he obtained the uh, distributional geometry by trying to unify three different differential operators. So one is the standard derivative of, of mathematics. There's mathematics as a canonical derivative which acts in differential form. This is an in geometry. Don't worry if you don't know, but it extends the usual derivative of function. You can also differentiate spaces. So in cohomology and homology, you learn that the derivative of a space is the boundary of that space. This is something you can prove. And you can also, if you, you belong to the Stein cult, you also know there's something called the Stein operator, uh, which allows you to differentiate vector with respect to a measure. This is, again, a different type of uh, differential operator. So George Arrival realized you could think about all these different things from a single point of view. And he developed something called like Durham currents, which are uh, also distributional objects. So these are two key ideas. They're essentially the same. And um, the key aspect of it is that you're trying to define the derivative of, uh, of a distribution. So if you try to differentiate a distribution in a direction, usually that's, uh, that involves like a, a, a limit and a differentiation. Here, the derivative of mu in the direction x, what you do is that you push forward the distribution 
mu along uh, you translate you use the transition operator along x is what uh, here you this operation is just translating the distribution by minus t along the x-axis you're taking the difference of that you're taking the limits this is how you're going to try to define like uh, your your derivative this is a standard notion of derivative a derivative is actually something that um uh, approximate this rate of change along a path here's going to be the transitional path of an object so if if mu here was just a function this would be the usual definition of derivative which goes going to do the same for measures now this here on the right hand side is a path on the space of this uh, on the space of all measures it's a topological vector space uh the problem is that this limit is not going to exist on that topological vector space this is kind of like the key idea of uh, one key is of uh, one, one key aspect that you need to take into account. Um, to understand a bit that, like uh, what, what is going on more precisely, is that if you wanted to differentiate the function which is zero everywhere except at zero in which it is one, so what is called like the delta function. So that's a non-smooth object. So usually you you wouldn't be able to do that. So the key idea of distribution theory is well, I don't know how to do that, but I know how to differentiate smooth objects. And now you're going to use topology, so what we did before. So you're going to try to define the derivative of my non-smooth function by defining a sequence of smooth objects converging to that. Uh, so a, a sequence of a number of Cauchy function converging to that delta function. And then you're going to build your topology such that if mu is the limit of smooth objects, then the derivative of this smooth object will converge somewhere. So it's not going to convert to like a measure, but it's going to convert somewhere. And you're going to define that limit as a distributional derivative. So this is what allows you to write this really amazing uh, thing that tells you that the derivative of a direct measure is actually a differential operator. And what you obtain using this distributional geometry is the unification of the two important operations of mathematics, integration and differential operators. Every integral and differential operator, every combination of this operator is going to be a uh, distributional object, something called like a distributional section geometry, and conversely. So really, you can think about distributional geometry as what happens when you put integration and differentiation together uh, in a current way. So this is how uh, Schwartz when it's still fed on. OK, so last thing I'll mention, unless my time is up. Seven. Oh, yeah, OK. OK, um, okay so basically, how, now we have this. Uh, this is basically distributional geometry. We can now define this subject nabla row of mu. So previously, when we were defining MMD, we were using this sign measure, the difference between the and row. We were thinking about it topologically, so not really as a measure, but more like as a continuous linear functional on a function space. And we were just uh, yeah uh, defining MMD that way. Now we're gonna define our discrepancy using this object, which thanks to uh, Schwartz we can define uh, rigorously. So this uh, covariant derivative of rho respect to a nab, which we measure mu, not necessarily a smooth one, is gonna be like what's called well, it's gonna be a um, well distribute. It, it's a distributional uh, measure value one form. But basically, just think about it as a continuous inner functional on vector fields. That's it. It's going to act on vector fields, on direction, and it's going to give you a real number. Uh, in particular, just as before, it's going to satisfy the nice property that if uh, the discovered derivative is zero, then that's the same uh, as mu being equal to rho. So if, you're, if you apply this to all vector fields, this left hand side, and you get zero, then that actually tells you this measure is the same. Uh, again, we're going to use the exact same idea. So we're going to mix this differential geometry with like Schwartz theory. Uh, and we're going to use a small, dense uh, set of vector fields, H, to test, to rather than test this covariant derivative of all, over all vector fields, we're going to test it over uh, much smaller uh, Hilbert spaces of vector fields. So when uh, the type of spaces we use are going to depend on the type of regularity of, uh, of mu. So in the case in which mu is actually smooth, so it has a, uh, also a density with respect to the bag. Uh, it's also like this kind of like one density. Then you can choose your Hilbert and soft space to be just a space of square integrable uh, functions. In which case, like basically the restriction of this covariant derivative to that little Hilbert space is going to give you what is called like score matching, uh, which I think was first, this kind of expression was first written down at UCL, uh, but like, 15 years ago, something like that uh, by average. So you're going to get this, this kind of objects, score matching. 
Um, in the case in which mu is arbitrary, it could be like any random measure, it could be like a, a discrete measure and so on. Then you're gonna choose H to be uh, RKHS of different fold vector fields, in which case you're gonna get uh, what's called uh, sometimes like diffusion kernel standard discrepancy, uh, which depends on like a reproducing kernel, but just now it's gonna uh, be matrix valued, but essentially, uh, Instead of being a scalar valued function of two variables, it's going to be like a matrix valued function of two variables. But anyway, the restriction of uh, this covariant derivative to this space is going to have that expression. So you can see in both this expression that uh, mu only appears as an integral and rho only appears by differentiation. And of course, you can see here that uh, this subject is acting linearly over mu. I, I mean, because it's acting by integration, it must be linear. So you can see why it was actually necessary to not use this like uh, log density. And in fact, not using this log density, like not thinking as of the differential information of rho as being in its log uh, density is what allows you to think about square matching and KSD as the same object, like as the same, uh, as the norm of the exact same object. Like normally you would have to think like, oh, my mu here is smooth, so I, I, I'm going to use a logarithm, even I'm not going to use a logarithm. Like the reason that the logarithm does appear here is, is that it should have never appeared in the first place. It can appear if you want, if you have sufficient regular, uh, regularity, but it's not a canonical object. So it's actually quite nice. It's this differential idea, differential geometry ideas from homology actually like, well, they make sense. They allows you to see very different types of discrepancy at the same time. And what that does in practice uh, is that you are able to prove results about uh, KSDs and about score matching the exact same way. So that's a, a problem that we have in uh, when we introduce our KHS the way it's done in stats and ML, is that we think about the reproducing kernel all the time. We always think about this function of two variables. But most of the actual results that we prove don't depend on it. They depend on, on this much more general kernel operator that I've defined above. And that is why, actually, in papers, you often see like the exact same results like at the mathematical level proved for score matching and KSD, including in my papers. I've done exactly that. Um, just you have two different proofs. You have much longer proofs because the kernel actually makes the proofs much longer. Um, but once we introduce all these nice geometric aspects, this kind of all these things that appear, I realize there's a lot of different uh, notion I've introduced in this talk. But actually, all we're kind of doing is like differentiating and restricting. We're kind of like looking at measure. We just think about them in different uh, contexts. We're just understanding this like mathematical literature, and then all we're doing is kind of like defining, oh, well, either I'm a set measure or I'm trying to differentiate, and then I just restrict that to like a smaller space. And that's how I get like uh, this discrepancy. Um, yeah, so actually the rest, uh, let's see. The rest it was just about introducing like uh, one result from uh, the paper, I think like that doesn't matter that much to me. So like, um, um, just to mention that the same ideas as, as before are going to be still true at this topological here. So the way we're going to build useful discrepancy is by choosing a uh, Hilbertian subspace, which is dense in an appropriate subspace space of vector fields. And we're going to have in particular that uh, in this case, like this DKSD is zero, if and only if this measure actually is equal. We're gonna, the same idea that we had before is still going to be true because it relies on very similar topological argument is in that when our kernel separate distributions, um, that's not going to be quite enough to control weak convergence because we're going to have this mass escape phenomenon. But that's going to be enough to control tight weak convergence. So tightness just means that the sequence of distribution we're analyzing to the convergence is sequentially compact, which basically just means it has no mass escape. So this is kind of the rigorous way you think about mass escape is about sequential compactness, which just means that every subsequence has a convergence subsequence in that space. And this is how this sequential compactness is topological. This is how you relate uh, piece separation to convergence, like this much stronger property. Uh, so yeah, in, in terms of result, we're gonna first prove that uh, using denseness, so using topology, we're gonna first prove that our choice of uh, kernel allows us to create a, uh, an RKHS which is dense, and that's gonna give us piece separation. Now, this is equivalent to control of tight convergence, so that gives us this thing. And then the last thing we're going to do is try to understand better the, um, the convergence properties of our sequence, so the sequential compactness, and how can we ensure the sequential compactness, what type of sequences have sequential compactness, or how can we build a kernel 
which is going to be enforcing the sequential compactness in the sense that if, if a sequence of distribution does converge, then it's automatically tight. And so actually this control of tightly convergence is just the same as with convergence. So yeah, same ideas. Uh, yeah, but that's it. I think now I'll just, uh, if there are questions, just answer those. Yeah. Okay. Good question, Ruth. Um, and, um, is there any question about where this log is from? The score matching there? Uh, it's just to ensure you're integrating respect to mu and not respect to rho. Um, Sorry. Okay. Um, and then remember, remember it's expected, right? Yes. Like the equals out to the end of the log. So if, if you see actually this object, um, this distributional. So if I go back to the actual expression for my covariant derivative, uh, you can see here that you're differentiating mu and rho, but actually this rho appears here, and this rho is actually the thing you're gonna be integrating on if your object mu is smooth. So that's the thing, because this mu, uh, so, okay, but put it that way. If mu is not smooth, then you have this expression, you have no choice but to integrate over mu. That's the only thing it can do. So it will differentiate with to rho and integrate over mu. However, if mu is also smooth, which is actually the case in score matching, then you have a choice. Because you can actually add the logarithm here, and this rule will become a mu. So you can either integrate with this thing with respect to, to rho, and you will not get a logarithm, or you get a logarithm here, but now you integrate with respect to mu. So essentially, this is the, a choice that is given by the fact that uh, mu and rho are in the same measure class. They have uh, the equivalent measures. You have this choice, uh, which you don't have in, in division KSD. I know it sounds weird, but if you, like in the other one I mentioned after, you don't have a choice. You can only do it, you cannot differentiate, yeah, you can only integrate with respect to mu. In scrum matching, in principle, you have a choice. Um, yeah. yeah. There might be something that's happened. Yeah, oh. it might just be like, it might just be something. Yeah. <laughs> nice, Ronald. <laughs> well, I just depend on that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs>